You're listening to the Turn Autism Around podcast, episode number 77. Today, I am welcoming Dr. Marlene Sotelo, who is both a music therapist as well as a board certified behavior analyst at the doctoral level. I found her uh, just last week. I found her and the fact that she had both credentials to be super fascinating. So I wanted to have her on the show to talk more about the power of music therapy and the research behind it. Uh, Dr. Sotelo is the Chief Operating Officer for the Ells for Autism Foundation, in addition to her background as a music therapist and as a BCBID. She's also a regular education teacher and a special education teacher, and she has worked with individuals with autism for over 25 years and now is uh, doing amazing work and amazing research down in Florida. So please help me welcome Dr. Marlene Sotelo. So thanks so much for joining us today, Marlene. Hi, it's great to be here. Yeah. Thank you, you have for such a yeah, you have such a great background being a music therapist and a behavior analyst that I just had to interview you. So um, first of all, why don't you tell our listeners how you got started and describe your fall into the autism world? Sure. And, and that's exactly what it was. It was a bit of a fall. Um, I always say autism found me and I never left after that. So I was doing my internship in music for music therapy um, at a hospital and in my work I became friends with uh, one of the nurses there and eventually she left and contacted me and asked me to come and play my guitar for her child had he had just been diagnosed with autism and I told her I don't know anything about autism and she said it doesn't matter just bring your guitar and, and just sing to him the way you do to the kids in the hospital and I said okay and so that's where my journey started. And after that, um, she referred me to other families. And before I knew it, I had a full caseload and uh, went on to continue seeing clients uh, that have autism using music therapy. And what year was your internship? That was in 1989. 1989. Uh, 1989, long time ago. Wow. Yeah, that is a long time ago. Well, I'm I'm viewing you on video and you don't look old enough to be uh, <laughs> doing your internship in 1989. So you got started way long time ago. Okay. So, okay. So you were a music therapist. You started working with kids with autism back in 89. And then at what point did you uh, move on to becoming a behavior analyst or how was that journey? Sure. Well, um, I, I really love to learn and um, I always feel uh, wherever the pinball goes, that's where I head. And after my journey as a music therapist, I ended up getting the opportunity to get my master's degree paid for by the hospital I was working for. And so I went on to uh, get a degree in diagnostic teaching. So I actually worked in the school system, public school system, as a special education teacher of varying exceptionalities. Um, so that was my uh, first, first opportunity to be part of the education world. And then I went on to work for the University of Miami Center for Autism and Related Disabilities and got a further opportunity to get uh, another degree. And so I'm all about free. And so I said, gosh, I'm going to get my doctorate paid for. Let's go. And so I went on to get my doctorate in education and I studied, um, I, I took courses necessary to become a behavior analyst at the same time. And so I was able to accomplish both of those and become a behavior analyst in 2010. Wow. So yeah, I, I'm the same way. I got my master's degree from University of Pennsylvania because I was working at the University of Pennsylvania hospital. Um, and, uh, that was prepaid tuition at Penn and I got my master's degree and then I finished up my, uh, I did my PhD in leadership and, um, finished in 2011. So not that far off from your journey. So, so what did 
the behavioral uh, approach and becoming a behavior analyst do for your role as a music therapist or your interest in music therapy for kids? So to me, it, it really was a journey of, of using what I already was using to motivate students to learn, to participate, um, and to be, be engaged, uh, but in a more formal way to really put labels to what I was already doing. Because of my background as a music therapist and a special education teacher, I had the knowledge of the strategies that we use as behavior analysts, um, but I didn't call them what we as behavior analysts call them. And so it was really great to be able to um, learn further about the terminology that are, that's used by behavior analysts and also the data collection. Um, so that I could really measure the results of the work that I was doing, because as a music therapist, we weren't we weren't directed to collect data. Um, we we had our goals and objectives, but it wasn't as systematic as a behavior analyst and, and the science that we know that we're supposed to follow in collecting data. So this helped to structure my sessions, and it helped uh, to be able to guide me in creating very specific goals for my for my clients. Yeah, I have. Uh, way back when Lucas was three years old, one of the first moms I met after his diagnosis, um, one piece of advice she gave me, and this is back in the late 90s, 1999, she told me that her son, who was, I don't know, eight at the time, really benefited from music therapy and was learning to play the violin. And, and she recommended that I get a music therapist and start music therapy. And I, uh, went and bought Lucas a drum at this local drum store. And there I met his music therapist, uh, uh, somebody who came to be his music therapist for over two decades now. Um, her name is Cindy and she's a certified music therapist and she is a uh, special ed teacher. And because she worked with Lucas, both in our home, when he was little, she worked, then I, I had her, um, introduced her to the private school that Lucas was going to for a short time. So she got a contract there. Then she got a contract with the local autism society to provide group music classes. And, um, he, he still participates in, in the music therapy, even as a young adult. And I've seen his progression over the years. And also with my clients, they have different age groups. So if I'd have a client, I don't see one-to-one -one clients anymore, but when I did have local clients, um, I would encourage them to go to, to sign up for the free music therapy groups through the Autism Society locally, because it was a chance for their children to practice group responding and imitation. And I knew how good Cindy was. And also, um, it was also a chance for them to meet as moms and they became friends because they all met each other at music groups. So there was several, several benefits from it, but I am so pro music therapy and using music. And I don't see that same enthusiasm with many behavior analysts. So when I found out about you and your background recently, um, to being a combined music therapist as well as a BCBID, I was very interested in talking to you because I want to know, you know, P B many BCBAs don't think that music therapy has enough evidence, is empirically supported enough to be using it. And so I just want to put that out there and have you educate me and my audience in terms of what is the research uh on music therapy? Sure. Uh, well, the, the National Clearinghouse had put out uh, their recommendations for evidence-based practices um, years back, and they're about to, by the end of this month, they're going to be publishing their new results. And from what I understand, uh, it might be that music therapy is now listed as an evidence-based intervention. Um, in the previous report, it was listed as an emerging evidence-based intervention. The reason being is that there wasn't sufficient research from various researchers. So one of the one of the criteria that this organization looked for was that 
there, it wasn't the same group of people doing the research to demonstrate the efficacy of that intervention. So they needed more variation. And so um, I'm, I'm hoping that the results that I've heard are going to come true and demonstrate that it really is an evidence-based practice. But even putting that aside, let's just think about from a common sense standpoint and really from what the research says about brain's neuroplasticity and the impact of music. We know that people who have had traumatic brain injury, people who have Alzheimer's, those who have been infected by a, a brain trauma are very receptive and responsive to music. So why is that? Because music provides structure to the brain. It provides the rhythmic patterns that are necessary to support motor movements by having rhythm, rhythm is, is processed in the brain on the left side. And the melody of music is processed in the right side. So if you have a, a traumatic brain injury that's affected your motor skills and your language skills, the music is a, giving you a tool to support the rehabilitation of those neural pathways. And it's actually affecting multimodal areas of the brain. So you get double bang for your buck. So instead of just doing, let's say, the physical therapy exercises that you would have to engage in for rehabilitation, you insert music into it, and now the brain has something to hold on to, to be able to have better progress. So let's bring that to autism. We know that our kids demonstrate motor difficulties. Um, many of them have motor coordination, motor planning issues. So when we use music to help facilitate that, we're enhancing the neural connections in that child's brain to be able to process the motor movements that they are required to engage in. So by using drumming, by having rhythmic marching, instead of just walking, if we're doing it to a beat, it's going to help them to be able to produce better results. If we move to the language part, of, which is a core deficit of children with autism, when we're using melodies, we are enhancing the language processing in the right side of the brain. So if we're just looking at brain research, we can see the support for the utilization of music as an enhancement to behavior analytic in, uh, intervention, because it's going to be a support system to helping that child to be able to learn and progress. Yeah. And, and I like the way you're breaking that down um, for me and, and my listeners, because, you know, everything doesn't have to be a multiple baseline design study published in Java for it to be effective. It does make common sense if you just look at the, the benefits of music and the right and the left-hand side of the brain um, in terms of looking at, at people that have had strokes or people that, like you said, have had uh, traumatic brain injuries and for autism. Is, is there research on autism and music therapy? There is, there, there is uh, quite a bit of research and <clears throat> which is why they're um, hopefully now gonna be able to officially make it a, an evidence-based intervention for individuals with autism. So there has been research um, on the use of music uh, to, for um, manding, for tax. So all, all of the verbal operands, there was a comparative study by Lynn in 2011, um, where they looked at the comparison of um, the, um, I apologize for stumbling on my words, for um, gaining more vocabulary through direct speech and language therapy versus the addition of music. Um, and although both made gains, the group that was in the music uh, therapy group actually made greater gains. And, and I, uh, just like I was telling you now, the facilitation of the melody and the rhythm that comes with music is going to enhance that individual's learning. And not only the learning, but the maintenance, which we know is difficult for children with autism to maintain and generalize many of the skills we teach them. And we know that music is a tool for memory. So it's going to help to um, allow that child to maintain the skills that we've learned. 
Yeah, that's great. And if you want to send me a couple of the studies that you refer to, we can put that in the show notes and that might help people, both parents and professionals who want to take a look more at the research. But, and, and in addition, just from using my example, especially with the little clients that I sent to music therapy and groups, there's additional benefits for group responding, for imitation, for um, even parental support within group music therapy if the parents are staying there. Um, mm-hmm. it, are there other benefits that I'm not mentioning besides all the ones we did mention? Well, a- as you mentioned, in regards to appropriate social behavior, especially in a group setting, you're, you know, um, we have difficulty in teaching greetings. And if you think about a preschool or kindergarten classroom, why do they have circle time why do they use music in circle time? They're using it, first of all, it, it provides a routine. It's the same repetition of the information. So we have the weather song, we have the days of the week song. It's ingrained in these kids' heads because of the repetition. And the, and the music helps to enhance the memory. And so um, it, it's going to help with those social behaviors also about um, greeting each other. So um, usually in my music therapy groups, I always have a a hello song and I have a goodbye song. And when I have it in a group, we always have to say hello to each of the people that are in our group. So it also helps to promote eye contact because you're looking looking towards the other individuals in the group as you're singing hello to them. Passing along the drum, so we're sharing materials, we're working on that uh, socialization skill. Um, It also allows for body awareness. So when we're, when we're playing instruments fast or slow or loud or soft, so that sensory experience is also enhanced um, uh, with the individuals when, when you're using music. And um, most importantly, it enhances learning. So when, I, when I'm working with my individual clients, which prim- I, I, I don't get the opportunity to work as a music therapist as, as much as I used to now in my new role, um, but when I do see my clients, I use songs that I've either, either written myself or the ones that are fantastic ones that are out there to teach concepts, uh, to teach concepts, whether it's about multiplication um, or if it's, a, um, you know, vocabulary, uh, the planets, uh, the states. If you, if you think about, um, do you remember that uh, Saturday morning, it's called Schoolhouse Rock. Oh, right. Remember that song? Yeah. I still, to this day, remember the, the song, Conjunction, Junction, what's your function? Right? I mean, right. that was so many years ago. They knew what they were talking about when they put music to such difficult, ta- uh, difficult concepts, even like a bill. When they're talking about the government and how bills are passed through, they use music to teach kids these difficult concepts. So music really helps to enhance learning of uh, complex uh, concepts. Yeah, I think all of those uh, skills are super important. Even just sitting, sitting on a mat, sitting on a chair, keeping your hands to yourself and and then following along. I mean, those are just some of the basic uh, requirements to learning that I've seen. You know, sometimes when my little clients would come the first day for music group, it wouldn't go so well because they weren't used to the routine. And, and, you know, I would meet them there to ensure that we were delivering enough reinforcement. And, but then those behaviors of sitting and attending, sitting on a mat or a chair would then go to preschool where they would be uh, introduced more to sitting or sitting at the table for learning at home. Um, so I just think there's so many benefits that that's why, a couple of years ago, you know, I posted some some little study on music therapy and and some behavior analysts like commented like, how dare you, you know, this isn't evidence-based. I'm like, well, hold on a second, buddy, because, uh, you know, evidence-based is partially your clinical experience for sure. Just because it doesn't have double blind placebo effect studies, which very few things actually do, um, doesn't mean it's not beneficial. Plus, as a parent, there are at least 100 hours a week where you need to keep your kid uh, busy and stimulated. And if, 
even if it didn't have all the benefits you listed, which are just so huge, um, it would, if, if the child is happy and sitting and enjoying and clapping and imitating and sharing instruments, then it's a win, right? And right. It, it would make it that, you know, even just to, to fire new neurons, you know, um, I'm actually during the COVID shutdown, I decided that I was, I'm going to learn to play the piano. So I started taking piano lessons from Lucas's music therapist online, um, and bought a, uh, online course, which is going really well. And so at any age, music can be very beneficial. Even if you're super busy, just developing a new skill on something like piano or guitar or singing, um, can really help you, um, hopefully, uh, stop some of the aging process and, and keep your memory sharp. I mean, I'm sure I, I know there's research on that. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, we're, like I mentioned, we're able to use music to help to, uh, stimulate different pathways in the brain. And so, um, with the brain being so, um, so neuroplastic that it can create these new pathways. If we use that the music as the vehicle to be able to make those connections, we're going to get better results. And another point I want to make sure to bring up is that as behavior analysts, we know that we are always seeking out reinforcements. We need to set the stage to motivate that individual to want to engage with us because we don't want to sit at a table with a child that's crying and wants to leave or we're working with a young adult and they're, they're bigger than us and they don't want us to tell them what to do. Well, what I have found is that music is the easiest way to pair myself and formulate that relationship with my client and to motivate them to engage in learning. A lot of times in the music therapy session, the client doesn't even realize that they're learning that they're actually engaging in the therapeutic uh, skills that I need them to, to do because they're just having fun. They're singing, they're playing instruments, they're dancing. And so that's, what, that's the funnest part about using music in there is that it makes your job easier as a behavior analyst because who doesn't like music? Some people now have asked me, well, what about those kids who cover their ears? And, there's, and because of sensory issues, that gives us a great opportunity to desensitize them and to slowly um, help them to be accepting of music, to make choices of what types of songs. So they're, um, they're practicing their independent skills and making those choices. They're um, given the independence to make it really loud or make it really soft so that they have volume control. So we're giving them that opportunity as well. Um, it also helps them to be able to get out their frustrations. You get these guys some drums and some uh, mallets and you say, let's go and just bang it out. It, it's a great sensory experience for them. And it's using that energy in a positive way. So that um, also in regards to uh, the, um, the drums, I had this one child that was always engaging in these stereotypies, these hand movement stereotypies. So I was able to reduce those during the sessions to be able to get him to learn um, more rapidly by using the drum mallets. So he loved to make sounds on the drums. So I was able to engage his hands in an appropriate activity so that he wouldn't be um, engaging in the self-stimulatory behaviors. So again, non-compatible behavior uh, was taking place in order for him to be able to um, play the drums. Same thing with the xylophones or any other music instrument that you can imagine. Yeah. Um, the friend who initially recommended music therapy to me, I said her son was about eight or 10 when, when I met her and Lucas was first diagnosed and, and her son went on and he had his pretty moderate to severe autism. He needs supervision and everything. Um, he went on to play first chair of violin in high school and went on to like county chorus and statewide chorus. And I know kids with, uh, you know, autism who are in musical theater production. So sometimes it also provides an outlet for a real talent, for a skill, even for a job long term. Um, and so that is also some of the benefits. So how does music therapy differ from music class or private music lessons? 
Sure. So if you're taking, if you're um, doing a music class that's for education, like it, let's say you're a, a music teacher at school, at a school, or you're a private guitar instructor, your primary goal is to teach the instrument, is to teach music theory or reading music. Um, but you're, 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 that's what you're focused on. As a music therapist, that's secondary. So if I'm teaching an individual how to play piano, as a music therapist, my, my goal is not for him to necessarily learn how to play piano. It's to follow instruction, is to pay attention, is to um, isolate their fingers for motor planning, fine motor uh, skills, is to be able to um, manage their sensory system, to know the pressure that they have to press on each key, but in a functional way. So the instrument learning how to play that instrument is secondary to the therapeutic goals that I'm trying to achieve as a music therapist. And also music certified music therapists don't just work with kids with autism or developmental disabilities too. They can work in hospitals, they can work on pediatric units, they can work with pain um, and those sorts of things. Anything else I'm missing with music? Well, end of life, a lot of music therapists work in hospice. Uh, they also work with the elderly, with dementia uh, patients. Uh, my mom has Alzheimer's, and uh, we've been able to have a, um, a music therapist work with her and uh, to see her light up when uh, the woman has gone and with her guitar and sings to her. Um, it, it, it really is incredible to see her light up like that. Uh, so they're also in the NICU, there are music therapists that work with infants as well. And when I... Um, when I did my internship, I actually worked in the surgical unit for part of my rotation, and I did music relaxation before, during, and after surgery. So I worked with uh, patients that were going to have um, the metal rods put in to their back for scoliosis, and so I would prepare them in advance with music specific selected for them, and I'd um, w work with them through guided imagery and I'd actually go into the operating room with them until the moment that they were completely under anesthesia and they were listening to music. That music continued on as soon as they recovered out of um, in ICU and I was with them there. So it was used for pain management and to be able to relax them in this anxious state of knowing that they were gonna have a major surgery on their back. Wow. So we've talked all about the benefits and all the success with music therapy. So what are specifically to kids uh, and adults with autism, what are the obstacles or struggles that parents and professionals might face if their child receives music therapy? Well, the key obstacle for the families at this time is that most insurance carriers do not cover music therapy. So it's all private pay. Um, there is one carrier that has now started to offer um, to, some, to some degree, but it's, it's just in the early stages. So that is one of the biggest barriers because financially, where are you going to put your money, right? If you're, are you going to put your money um, in this therapy, speech therapy, behavior therapy with all the co-pays, right? Because that could be, become very financially draining, or are you going to pay out of pocket for it? The other obstacle is that um, ju just like in the field of education, you have teachers that teach in one way, very structured, very organized, and then there's other teachers that it's fly by the seat of their pants. You know, they're coming up with a lesson on the go. I found that there's a lot of music therapists as well. And there are, in order for it to be successful, you have to understand autism and you have to know what are the strategies that help people with autism to be engaged? So you need to structure your session. You need to use visual supports. You need to have clear beginning and end of repetition so that they know what's expected. You need to have communication tools so that if the individual can't verbalize, they still have their commenting board or they have a device that they could, I use a, um, a Big Mac, I don't know if you're familiar with that or the audience, it's a big red button, like the Staples button. And I can program individual messages so that my, my kids in the group that can't say hello, they can use the device uh, to be able to do that. So if you, if you have a music therapist that doesn't know autism, they may run into difficulties in 
managing behaviors that might appear during their sessions. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest thing, especially when you're talking about groups, because not only do you have to, if you're doing individual music therapy, you have to, you know, be aware of that person, but then you add groups and some of these nonprofits like the local autism society would fund music therapy and allow anybody to sign up. And then mm -hmm. you might get a child in the group that you don't know. And now they've got you know, a lot of challenging problem behaviors. I see that as being an obstacle, certainly the pay. Hopefully if it, if it does get on the list of more evidence-based practices, um, maybe insurance companies would then start to fund more of it, hopefully. And, um, and I know in private autism schools, um, they tend to have music therapy in groups once a week or something like that. Um, so people might be exposed that way. Um, yes. But I, I think we, we definitely covered some of the main benefits and hopefully as the years progress, we will um, get more and more funding for music therapy. Are you involved with any research on music therapy now? I'm not at this time. I. Um, as, as the Chief Operating Officer of the Els for Autism Foundation, I, I'm quite busy in, in running our, our big campus here in Jupiter, Florida. Yeah, tell and, us a little uh, bit about your role there and what you do there. Sure. I oversee all the operations of the campus. We serve individuals with autism spectrum disorder as well as other developmental disabilities. And we have two public charter schools on our campus, and we serve... Uh, over 300 individuals with autism a day uh, at, on any given day between the two schools and the services that the foundation provides. And one of the first programs that I launched when we opened in 2015 was Music Therapy Group. Um, so we had our, our signature golf program that we had developed. And then the other program that we started was Music Therapy uh, because that's my baby, and I and I knew I knew how to do it, and I knew uh, that we could get it started right away. And so we offer music therapy, dance therapy, and all different uh, types of recreational programs. And uh, we we see children as young as 18 months, and uh, adults as old as 65 um, at our at our center. Wow! So I, I'm awesome. busy with that. We do we are engaged in research studies. Um, at the center, so we have a partnership with the Seaver, um, the Seaver Center, the Seaver Autism Center at Mount Sinai in New York, and we're doing some genetic study with them. We're also doing an early intervention study um, for a program that we developed called Spring Into Action Together. It's a parent and child dyad, and within that program, they're using music for the parent and child to engage and to really work on joint attention and um, eye contact, vocalizations. And uh, we've also uh, done some studies on the use of exercise and, and golf and other sports to, um, to engage individuals with autism. Wow, it sounds like an awesome center and an awesome foundation. So uh, we will put the link to that in the show notes as well. Do you have an easy website for people to um, find you? Yes. it's. Ellsforautism.org and Ells okay. spelled E L S for Mr. Ernie Ells, World Hall of Famer golf um, golf legend. And so he is responsible for funding the initial start of the organization because he has a, a child with autism. Is that right? Yes, yes. He has a son with autism, and uh, so him and his wife Liesel started the foundation. And uh, they uh, went on this journey to build a campus that uh, would serve people with autism uh, and also reach out to the rest of the world uh, on best practices. So we also have a foundation in Canada, in England, and in South Africa. Wow. Yes. We're very busy. Yeah, that sounds, it sounds, and I've heard of him, obviously, um, and we'll, we will definitely, uh, link that in the show notes, Els, uh, Els for autism foundation.org. Els for autism.org. 
Okay, L's for autism.org. Okay, great. So before we leave for today, um, it's been really enlightening and great information about music. I love that. Um, part of my podcast goals are for parents and professionals to be less stressed and lead happier lives. So I'm wondering if you have any two or three tips on what helps you with stress reduction or management or self-care tips. Absolutely. I exercise in some way, shape or form every day. And of course, with that, I have my music in my ears um, as I'm exercising to keep me motivated. So I highly suggest everybody keep on moving um, to, to re reduce the stress. Um, I also um, highly encourage listening to uh, calming music and meditating. There's a lot of great um, apps out there. There's a lot of things that are free right now that are available to families. Um, and lastly is remember what's most important. That's what I always think about each morning. Is it worth it or can I put it aside? Because what we need now is to be with our families and be grateful for what we have. And so just having gratitude and remembering what we're grateful for is my way of also um, staying healthy in my heart and in my mind and in my soul. Well, I think that's the an excellent way to leave us today. Thanks so much for your time in explaining the benefits of music therapy. And thanks for all you do for the autism community. It's been a real pleasure to interview you. Thank you so much, Mary. Thanks for having me. Bye.